Welcome everyone to Ecology Live. I'm Laura Graham. I'm chair of the Quantitative Ecology Special Interest Group and I'm associate editor for Methods in Ecology and Evolution. If it's your first time joining us, you're very welcome. And welcome back to all Ecology Live regulars. This is the third in our series of 12 free online talks in the, on the latest ecological research. The talks run every Thursday from now until the end of May. We thank Oxford University Press for sponsoring this whole season of Ecology Live. You can find details of an Ecology Live reading list that they've put together, including exclusive discounts on the slide at the end of this talk. Uh, so stay on to find out more. Thanks to, to Wildlife Acoustics for the wonderful soundscape that started this session. Um, just so you know, this talk's being recorded and it will be added to YouTube afterwards. At the end of the talk, there'll be a short Q&A session. Um, you can ask questions um, in the Q&A box um, throughout the talk, so you don't need to wait until the end to ask your question. Um, and you can leave your name when you ask the question or it can be anonymous. Um, you can also upvote any questions that you find particularly interesting um, using the thumbs up button. So today's talk is from Stefano Alenzia, um, Alessina, <laughs> um, and he's a theoretical ecologist at the University of Chicago. He studied environmental science at Università di Parma in Italy, uh, worked as a postdoc in Michigan and UC Santa Barbara before joining the University of Chicago in 2009. Stefano's research interests include species coexistence, network theory and food web structure, Today, he'll be speaking about the history, past present progress, and future of the Locke Volterra model, which is foundational to our understanding of population dynamics and community ecology. Okay, so Stefano, Stefano, it's over to you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you for the introduction, and thank you so much for, for the invitation uh, to, to speak. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and an honor. Uh, and today, I would like to take some a moment to celebrate the centennial of the Lotka Volterra equations, like some foundational equations in ecology. And I will review, you know, about the century of progress. And in doing so, I'll be able to mention some of my past work. And in fact, we will be able to take a peek at what I'm working on right now. But because like this story starts like a hundred uh, uh, years ago, uh, and the protagonists of the story were educated in what we would call the late Victorian era, I thought that to set the mood, we should have a quote from like the uh, British poetess, uh, Alice Maynell, uh, who said that if life is not always poetical, it is at least metrical. Periodicity rules over the mental experience of man according to the path of the orbit of his thoughts. Uh, and so this idea of a rhythm of life, a rhythm of nature, a balance of nature were very dear to the Victorian. And therefore, when we start our story in 1920, we find this paper by Alfred J. Lotka called Analytical Note on Certain Rhythmic Relations in Organic Systems. And in fact, Lotka starts with periodic phenomena play an important role in nature, both organic and inorganic. And here Lotka is referring to the fact that he's always had like this parallel between chemistry and population dynamics. But what I like really about this paper is the excitement that comes in this sentence. It was therefore with considerable surprise that the writer on applying this method to certain special cases found that these led to undamped and hence indefinitely continued oscillations. So who was this Alfred J. Lotka? He was a peripatetic scientist. He was born in what is now Ukraine from Polish uh, American parents, and then started like studying first in the UK, then in Germany, then in the US, then back in the UK. And he held an impressive variety of, of jobs. So he was peripatetic also in his career, including a chemist, uh, including like an editor for Scientific American, and then spent the better part of his career at the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company in New York City. He made a contribution to a variety of fields, including a most recognizable for, for demography and biostatistics. But in 1920, he published this paper that we were referring to. And in fact, it took a few years in 1922 to join Raymond Pearl, who you will notice is the person that communicated this paper to PNAS, who was like one of the first people to try to mathematize biology, to write his book, his, his famous book, Elements of Physical Biology. Among other things, he also started like uh, somewhat like the field of bibliometrics, 
studying whether like productivity and the number of scientists producing a certain number of paper at certain scaling relationship ended up writing more than 100 papers, five books, including titles such as like the money value of a man. All right, but back to, to the paper, what he was describing is a species uh, X, which he considered to be a plant species, say deriving its nourishment from a source presented in such large excess that the mass of the source must be considered constant during the period of time which we are concerned. And then the second species, Y, for example, an herbivorous animal species feeding on X. So you really had like this kind of population dynamics in mind. And then he wrote the famous equations, which are reported here in their simplest uh, uh, form. And so like this equation, we have like a, a predator and a prey. The, the prey is in blue in the in this slide and the predator is in red. And you can see here that the, the, the prey would grow exponentially if uh, left uh, alone uh, without like the, the predator. And then similarly, the predator will die exponentially fast if left alone without the prey, but because the two species interact, they can coexist. And when they coexist, you can see here, like these are the indefinite oscillations that Lotto was describing. There are two features, features that are important. First, you can see here that we have first like a minimum for the prey and then a minimum for the predator and similarly a maximum for the prey and a maximum for the predator. And second, is that these dynamics oscillate around the point one one, which you can see actually from the equation would be a point in which the dynamics would be still, right? So that's what we call an equilibrium point. There is another equilibrium point that is not interesting from a biological standpoint, which is when there's no predator, or no prey. Thank you very much. There's not going to be any predator or prey, right? So this is like the, the basics of this equation. In a second paper, also in 1920, but meet a journal in chemistry. Lotka derived what we call a constant of motion. And so I just want to, to go over the math for one second because it, it's quite simple and, and it's very informative. So what the, we have our equations here and what you can write is like an equation for how does X change in response to Y. And by using the chain rule, you would obtain this expression. And now what you can do is to separate these, uh, these equations by bringing like these to the left hand side and these to the right hand side. And so what you obtain are these equations here and now if you divide all the terms by x and y times y right what, here we would get a one here we would get minus one over x here we would get one over y here we would get minus one and so now you can see that the left hand side only depends on x the right hand side only depends on y therefore we can integrate these dynamics and if you remember your calculus from one we would get x from minus one over x we would get minus log of x plus a constant of integration. And similarly here, log y minus y plus another constant of integration. Now, if we bring all the variables to the left, all the constants on the right, we find that this quantity is constant through the dynamics, right? So this is a constant of motion, exactly like uh, planets orbiting the sun would conserve, say, the, the angular momentum. Here, there is like a number that is maintained through the dynamics, which means what? that these dynamics would form closed orbits in this plane where we have the prey on the X axis and the predator on the Y axis. And here I show like four trajectories starting from different initial conditions. And so you can see that this cycle counterclockwise uh, exactly as consistent with the fact that the, the, the prey would peak first and then uh, that they have, uh, you know, they, they have a higher speed of the dynamics when they're far away from zero, right? Like, so in this part here, you can see that here the points are quite sparse and here are bunched up. This will be important later on, right? So these are our famous uh, lotka volterra equations. Now, skip six years uh, and you find this paper in Nature, which is called the fluctuations in the abundance of a species considered mathematically communicated by Vito Volterra, who was a famous uh, Italian mathematician. I, I, importantly, this paper is like two pages. There's no equations. There is a graph exactly like the one that I just showed you, but there's no equation. All the equations are in a separate paper uh, in, in Italian with plenty of equations, which constitutes what we would call today the supplementary information for the two page paper in, in nature. And, and so Volterra considered two associated species of which one finding sufficient food in its environment would multiply indefinitely. So the exponential growth we saw before when left to itself while the other would perish for lack of nourishment if left alone. But the second feeds upon the first, and so the two species can coexist together, right? So this paper, even though it was very short, even though it had no equation, did not go unnoticed. And in fact, like 1927, you find this letter to the editor from Lotka, 
who says like, with regard to Professor Volterra's interesting article, I may be permitted to point to certain prior publications on the subject of which Professor Volterra seems to be unaware. And, and Volterra very graciously recognizes priority. I'm sorry not to have known of his work and therefore not have been able to mention it. And then concludes with something that I think is important, working independently, the one from the other, we have found some common results which should give rise to important applications. And, and of course, Volterra was right because after 100 years, we are here still talking about their famous uh, equations. But who was uh, Vito Volterra? So, so Vito Volterra started life not in the best way because he was born in a poor Jewish family in the papal state, which is not like great for Jewish families. And then his father died when he was two. And so his mother and he had to join like his uncle's family. Fortunately for him, he displayed an amazing mathematical talent from early on. And one of his professors, like in high school, Antonio Roiti, decided to convince the family to, to let him study like he, in college. And in fact, hired him as an assistant at the University of Florence. And from there, he went to the Scuola Normale Superiore di Pisa, which was like the best mathematics school in Italy under Enrico Berti, which was probably the best mathematician in Italy. And then he started like this meteoric ascent, like in his career, he was professor at 23. He moved to Rome like with the best chair in mathematical physics, made incredible contribution to the theory of functionals, uh, differential equation, integral differential equations, was nominated a senator, was also a patriot, so volunteered at age 40 something in the, in the army during World War I. Unfortunately for me, like this meteoric ascent also was matched by a meteoric descent with the advent of fascism in Italy in 1922, like the Mussolini government, which he opposed especially as the president of the Academia dei Lincei, which is like the oldest scientific uh, academy in the world, Galileo Galilei was part of the Lincei. And so he signed the manifesto against the, the fascism from the intellectuals. And especially in 1931, he refused to take this oath of allegiance to the fascist regime. And only 18 professors out of 1,251 did so. And all of them were forced to resign. And in fact, he had to resign from the Academia dei Lincei as well traveled a few years abroad, and then came back to Italy to die in 1940. So if you do the math, like he was born in 1860, so in 1926, he was 66 years old, right? Which is not the typical age in which mathematicians they pick up new tricks, right? So this was a very well-known mathematician. Like as I report here, this is the obituary that was published in Nature in, in, in 1941 that says that he was the best known of the many fine mathematicians whom Italy has produced in our time. He knew everybody and went everywhere. So how come that an aging mathematician all of a sudden falls in love uh, with ecology? He didn't have to fall in love with the ecology because his daughter, who was a, a biologist, fell in love with her professor, Umberto D'Ancona, this young professor that was a fish biologist. And Umberto had collected data on fish landings before and after World War I. So you can imagine like this was in the Adriatic Sea, which was basically fenced off during World War I, and therefore, like fishery has decreased dramatically during the period of the war. And what uh, Umberto had noticed is uh, that some uh, species of fish had greatly benefited from this closure of the fisheries, while some other did not. And in fact, like carnivorous fishes had benefited more than herbivorous fishes. And so he asked Volterra whether these could be explained mathematically. And I can imagine like Volterra saying, sure, let me just jot this on a piece of paper and in five minutes we have these equations. And these equations do exactly what you would expect. So, so this is the type of data that, uh, in, that Umberto was looking at. So you can see here, this is the total uh, catch in the market of Trieste, like uh, uh, you know, the fish market. And you can see that like during the year of the war, the, the quantity of catch like decreased dramatically. But if you see here, like in the same years, the amount of shark and rays, which are like the higher up uh, predators in, the, in this food chain, uh, increase propor in proportion quite dramatically, right? And, and so if you take your equations and you simulate this closure of the fisheries, so here is like before the war, now we start closing the fisheries, and what happens is that these trajectories move up and to the left, meaning the prey have a lower equilibrium and the predator have a, a higher equilibrium. And as Volterra put it in his paper, a complete closure of the fishery was a form of protection under which the voracious fishes were much the better and prospered accordingly. But the ordinary food fishes of which these are accustomed to prey were worse, or worse off than before. And you got to love like the language. It's too bad that we don't write papers like this anymore. All right, 
So that's the, what we call the Volterra effect. Now, there is one big problem with these equations if you're an ecologist, and the problem is the following. Imagine that now, instead of having a constant growth rate for the prey, we have prey that you know, grow faster during the summer, for example, and, and slower during the winter. So we have some sort of like sinusoidal uh, growth rate, which is at the top graph, right? What happens to the trajectories of the predators and the prey? So what you see here is that these trajectories shave like the axis, like zero, zero, very, very, very closely. And in fact, because like these dynamics are slower when we're close to zero, they sit at this zero place like for a very long time, which means that biologically these species would go extinct, right? Because like mathematically we can have like a fr small fraction of, of, a, of a predator, but practically we cannot, right? They come with the integers and therefore this result really lacks a robust coexistence. I think this poses a problem that has been solved, you know, and the, the way it's typically solved is to generalize slightly this model, right? So what we can write is this model, even with many species, not only two, we can write it in this generalized logical Volterra form, right? Where we cluster all our parameters into a vector of growth or death rates, which we call R, and then all the interactions between the species in a matrix, which we call the matrix of interactions A. So for the classic predator prey, right, we have that the growth rate of the prey would be one, the death rate of the predator would be one, so it's a minus one here, and then we have the interaction between the predator and the prey. Now you see that like a prey does not interact with themselves. What, what happens if we put like a small a negative number there, right? So what we're basically doing is to say the prey would grow, instead of growing exponentially, would grow logistically, right? So eventually if there were no predator, it would reach a, an asymptote one over epsilon, right? Whatever this number is. And so when we do this small modification, what happens to the trajectories is that all the trajectories now circle around like the equilibrium, but eventually reach it, right? So they spiral toward the equilibrium. And you remember that we wrote like a, a constant of motion before, so we can write the same constant of motion actually shifted, you know, like with this uh, Y star and X star, such that at equilibrium, this constant would be zero. Now, if you take the derivative of this uh, function over time, instead of finding a constant, right, like as we had before, you find the quantity that is always decreasing, right? So, so for any epsilon larger than zero, eventually this DVDT will go uh, uh, to zero, meaning like all the trajectories will go to equilibrium, and this is what we call a Lyapunov function, technically. All right, this general Zlotka Volterra model has been used very, very widely in, in ecology. And in fact, like the case of competitive interactions, so imagine that now we have positive growth rate for two competitors and we have negative interactions among all the possible combination of competitors. This is what we call the competitive uh, Lotka Volterra model. This was actually not studied by Lotka, Lotka, who was more interested in predator prey or parasite host, but was studied by Volterra in this famous long paper, the supplementary information, and also by Gauss, who also did this fantastic experiment with paramecium. And this is another set of equations that we teach all the students in ecology because it's fundamental to, to develop like limiting similarity. In fact, much of our modern coexistence theory is based on a very fine uh, analysis of this type of equations. And this also leads to the famous uh, interspecific competition should be larger than interspecific competition for robust coexistence which unfortunately holds only for two species. And so we have this paper with Yuri Barabash and Matt that, that shows that in fact, when you go to three species or N species, unfortunately there's no simple like mnemonics for that. What is very interesting, and I can talk about this more during the questions is that many other systems that at face value are not general as Lotka Volterra, they can be cast into a larger Lotka Volterra model. And so you can use the same machinery to, to analyze these kind of models. Okay, so that's very well for two species. We've seen like that any amount of self-regulation of the prey would lead to robust coexistence. What happens if we have many predators, many prey, so we have basically a food web, right? So now we have to switch gears to uh, uh, analyze the case of very many species. And what we're gonna do is like what is called local stability analysis, which is in fact present already in the paper by Lotka in 1920. So it goes back a long time as well. And the idea here is that we have our system that is sitting at our equilibrium, right? Exactly like when we spiral toward the equilibrium. And now we're gonna perturb this system somewhat, like a very small perturbation. And what we're gonna do is like the system, the system was at X star, we move it to X, and now we track what happens to a perturbation, right? Delta X, like the difference between these two. And because we're making a small perturbation, what we can do is to approximate 
this function by Taylor expanding around the equilibrium point, right? So, so we're just going to write an approximate function. And this uh, uh, Taylor expansion says, well, evaluate the function at the equilibrium point, but that's zero because that's an equilibrium point. Then we get a linear term, which is like a matrix J multiplied by the deviation from the equilibrium. And then we have higher order terms. So these we can set to zero, these we set to zero. Now we have to say, what is this matrix J? It's what it's called the Jacobian matrix that says, how does the growth rate of species I changes when we change the species J, right? So this is like the Jacobian matrix for the system of equations. And then when we evaluate this matrix at a certain point, we get a matrix of numbers. Uh, and that Levin's called that like the community matrix. So this is another fundamental concept in ecology. But the beautiful thing about this is that now we have a linear system of equations, right? Like so, we have d, delta x dt is just a matrix m multiplied by delta x. And so this turns out to be the only system of differential equation that we can really solve in full generality, and we know all about this. And in fact, we know that all that matters for like uh, these uh, uh, perturbations to subside and just go back to zero is that all the eigenvalues of this matrix M have to have a negative real part, right? So eigenvalues in general can be either real numbers, like the numbers we're used to, or complex numbers, or numbers that have a real part and an imaginary part. The real part has to be negative, okay? So with this math in mind, we can look at the contribution of Robert May in 1972, who studied like what happens to very large random ecological communities. Right, so, so what he said is like, this matrix M is really fundamental to understand, like these are basically are the interactions between the species around the equilibrium point, right? It's a linearization of our system around the equilibrium point. So what happens if we just draw a random matrix M, right? And the way we, we're gonna do it is we're gonna say, this is the sum of two matrices, A, a matrix of interaction, minus D times the identity matrix, which this would be the diagonal interactions. Exactly, you remember that we put minus epsilon on the diagonal of this matrix. This would be the self-regulation of the species, right? And so we build just like A as to be a random matrix, and we say two species do not interact with probability one minus C. C is what it's called the connector, say the probability the two species interact. So if they do not interact, we put a zero in the element ij of this matrix. If they do interact, we sample a random interactions say taken from a normal distribution with mean zero and variance sigma squared, right, with probability C. Then we have to look at these eigenvalues, right? So how do the eigenvalues of this type of metrics look? Uh, so this is on the right. So we have the real part of the eigenvalues on the x-axis, the imaginary part of the eigenvalues on the y-axis, and all we care about is actually just the real part. And we would like all of these eigenvalues to be to the left of zero, which is here. Right, so these metrics would not lead to a stable equilibrium, right? Because some of the eigenvalues are on the right of zero. But what you can observe is that these eigenvalues seem to form a perfect circle, right? And in fact, that's actually the case. It's what is called the circular law in random matrix theory, which is the branch of mathematics that deals with these uh, random matrices. So if it is a circle, all we need to know is where is the center of the circle? What is the radius of the circle? And then we're basically done. And so May was actually able to calculate what is the center and what is the, the radius. And the center is very easy because it's just whatever we put on the diagonal, this minus D, the strength of self-regulation sets the center of the circle, right? So we want to set the center to the left enough such that it offsets the radius. And what is the radius? It's just the, the product of the number of species, the connectance, and the variance of the interaction strength, and then you take the square root. And this is what may called complexity. And this paper was the one that st started the famous uh, stability complexity debate, right? So, so this is what happens in a random ecological community. Today, we're talking about predators and prey. So, so what happens to a random predator prey community, right? For that, you had actually to wait for 40 years, but then uh, uh, C. Tang and I uh, uh, derived like the similar result, right? Like for, instead of having a circle, now we have an ellipse, right? Again, we only care about the horizontal axis, and the horizontal axis is actually set by the correlation between the, predators, the, the interactions, right? So if we have predator-prey interactions, you can imagine that if AIJ, say the effect of the prey on the predator is positive, then the effect of the predator on the prey must be negative, right? So the product AIJ, AJI must be negative. That is what we call a negative correlation. And in fact, this correlation appears here in the criterion for stability of this ellipse. And so you can see that any number that is smaller than zero for rho for this correlation would stabilize somewhat the, the ecosystem in the sense that we need less self-regulation to have stability.
right? So, so that that means that the presence of brain interactions are somewhat, you know, stabilized. Now we need less self-regulation, but how much self-regulation do we need in the first place? So this uh, is something that we studied recently with Yuri Barabash uh, and other people. And so here is like a graph saying, what is the proportion of species self-regulating on the x-axis and what is the strength of self-regulation in the y-axis? And all you, I want you to take from this graph is that to have stability, you need a large fraction of species self-regulating. Even though you have predator prey interactions, even though you have whatever kind of interactions, many, many, many species need to self-regulate. And this is not really something we observe uh, clearly in the field, but, but uh, Yuri et al. concluded that either the overwhelming majority of all populations on this planet experience substantial self-regulation or else ecosystems are in fact unstable. Now, this gets to the, what I'm working on right now. And one <laughs> essential you know, a, a, a simplification that we're making where we write this a lot of alternative equation is to say that all the predators are identical, all the prey are identical, which we of course know it's not true, right? But we assume that these populations are uh, completely homogeneous. And, and I would like to say that contrary to what it says here on the Declaration of Independence, there is a self-evident truth that not all organisms in a population are created equal, right? So we have some sort of intraspecific variation. And what I'm asking today is, can this intraspecific variation affect dynamics? And if so, how does it affect dynamics? And so just to give you a peek of like my current work, I, I would like to consider two a modification of logical Volterra model in which we have two types of predator or two types of prey, which without loss of generality, we can assume these are like the two different sexes, right? There's the male predators and the female predators, for example. So how do we modify this equation to, to allow for this, right? So imagine that Y1 are just like the male predators and what we're going to do is to say, which is actually the case in many populations, unfortunately for me, is that, uh, you know, males live less long, live shorter amount of time than, than females, right? So they have a, an elevated mortality rate. That's how you would model it. And then a female have a lower mortality rate. So assume this epsilon is any number between zero and one, right? So that's like the mortality uh, of the, of the parent. Now, when they reproduce, you know, when a, a male reproduce or a female reproduce, they have 50% chance, about 50% actually, uh, to, to give rise to a new female or male, right? So, so what we're going to do is we're going to pull the reproduction and then divide it by two here, okay? The prey, they don't care whether they're killed by a male or a female, they just die, you know, exactly as before. So these equations, you can see that if you set epsilon to zero, then you can basically recover the classic logical Volterra model. But what I want to point out is dynamics now, instead of being neutrally, you know, cycling around this point with a constant of motion, do exactly what we had under self-regulation, right? They go to the equilibrium. Even though you can see here, there's no uh, actual self-regulation, no direct self-regulation of any species on any other species. We can do the same thing with two prey. Right now it's easier to say like they, they share their reproduction. So when males reproduce, they get like half of them uh, to be males and half of them to be females. But now we have like slightly different predation rate uh, from the predators on the two sexes. And again, like we, we have consistent equations that if we set epsilon to zero, we would recover Lotka Volterra. And again, instead of finding like this neutral cycling around this equilibrium point, we find global stability, right? So that's what I'm working on right now. And this actually leads to my conclusion that is the Lotka Volterra motor is a hundred years old, but it's still frisky to some extent. And it's, played really a central role in community ecology. And as I showed you, these predator-prey interactions have some sort of stabilizing effect in the sense that we need less self-regulation to stabilize these communities. However, we still need widespread self-regulation. And to get out of this pickle, I think that one of the most promising strategies is to account for this intraspecific variation that could remove the need for widespread self-regulation. With that, I would like to thank the, the members of my laboratory. There are my collaborators, Zach, uh, Carlos, Paulina, and Abby. I would like to thank the National Science Foundation for, for funding. And I would like uh, you to join me in wishing a happy birthday to the Generalized Lock Volterra model and 100 years of successes. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much for your talk. That was really, really interesting. Um, we're going to move into the Q&A portion now. Um, I've got a couple of um, questions here. Um, so Charlotte has asked um, about your comment around the fact that many other systems um, can display um, the generalised lock of Volterra dynamics, um, whether this applies to mutualistic systems. Definitely, yes. Right. So I have an extra slide. It's just like they took it out because it was a little more mathematical. But basically, you can write any system that can be written in this form, right, which is similar to Lotka Volterra, right? Like if this matrix were a square, right, this matrix A were square, B would be the identity matrix, you would get Lotka Volterra. This is what is called a quasi polynomial system in the literature. You can read like this in the work of Brenig et al., you know, starting in 1988. Any one of these systems can be turned into a larger logical Volterra system. And many systems that are not even in this form can be first turned into this, to this form and then into generous logical Volterra model. And what is the advantage there? That logical Volterra is the simplest nonlinear model for dynamics of population that we have. And therefore, we have a large toolbox that we can use to analyze this uh, type of models. So many, many, many models in ecology, evolution, and in epidemiology, in fact, can be mapped right back into Lotka Volterra model. And I'd be happy, to, if you write me an email, I'd be happy to send you references uh, showing how to do this for mutualism. That's great, thank you. Um, okay, so we've got another question here from Jochen, um, who's asked, uh, can you expand on why simple coexistence criterion intraspecific greater than interspecific does not work for greater than two species? Right, it, it, it's a bit, Technical, but it basically boils down to the fact that um, you know when we when we were looking at just like two species, we have like this very simple form for both like the feasibility, meaning like does an equilibrium uh, with positive densities right of the species because there's no such thing as minus five zebras, right? So, so these numbers have to be positive exists, and also we have a very simple way to go about like determining the stability of these things. And so you can do this by expanding on the coefficients that you have. And that's what you find, like the typical like thing that you teach to all undergraduates. Unfortunately, first of all, when we get to more than five species, it, it gets really complicated. Even just to solve for the equilibrium is not trivial, right? Like you have to invert these matrices and whatnot. And then stability analysis requires to solve like polynomials of the fifth degree or six degree, which is in, in general impossible. So, so that's one, one problem. It boils down to basically being able to determine the eigenvalues of the sum of two matrices. So that's what the trick that we're using in this paper with Yuri in 2016. So, so like it, it becomes incredibly more difficult to do. You know, you go one, two, fine, three is hard, four is almost impossible, five or more becomes a mess. Mm. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, so um, we've actually got loads of questions, but I think we're sort of um, running short on time for them. So I'm just going to ask you one last one from Jordan. Um, would there be feedback on the fitness of the prey or predators removing the least fit? And therefore, would the equilibrium point move as the fitness of the species becomes overall fitter? That, that is a very, very good question. So here, what we're assuming is that like uh, when you reproduce, you reproduce basically independently of the fitness, right? Because whatever is your fitness, you're gonna give rise to males or females with equal probability, right? You can generalize this model a little bit, like allowing for differential, like a, 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 you know, proportions, right? Imagine like something that doesn't abide by the rule of 50% for each sex. When you start turning in evolution, then I'm not exactly sure. But like the point is, even if you have a less fit phenotype, if you still produce it every so often by mistake, you know. Mm -hmm. These will always be present at low abundance in the population, right? So, and these will create the stabilizing effect. So, so that is a very interesting question. It's just that the, the models become a little more complicated. We have a paper with Dan Maynard, which I'm happy to say, send you, on a similar problem with the uh, cousin of the Lotka Volterra model, the replicator equation, where we show this type of dynamics. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, so just to say thanks to Stefano and um, thanks to everyone for joining the talk online. Um, next week at the same time, we'll have Duncan Cameron from the University of Sheffield, who will explore how soil organisms communicate with each other and talk about the wider consequences of these um, con conversations for soil ecosystems. If you're watching the recording on YouTube but would like to join future live talks, make sure you register for Ecology Live on the events page of the website. 
Um, and this week, the British Ecological Society have announced their next annual symposium taking place in London on the 11th to 12th of May next year. And this will be an exciting collaboration with the Royal Meteorolog Mete Meteorological Society on climate science for ecological forecasting. Um, and it will see e ecologists and climate scientists come together to identify the needs and opportunities for the greater interaction between these two fields. Um, for now, get the date in your diaries and I hope to see you there. And um, finally, I'll leave you with details of the offer from the sponsors of today's Ecology Live Talk, Oxford University Press. Use the discount code in the chat to receive 30% off their Ecology Live reading list. So that brings today's Ecology Live to a close. See you again next Thursday.